Good evening, everyone. My name is Chuck DeZorsi. I'm a Greenways Director and Busy Gardener with our local forest gardens. I'm glad to see so many people interested in planning a winter harvest. This is the fifth and last gardening course we'll be presenting via Zoom this summer. As a nonprofit organization, your donations are needed to fund these courses. Go to the Greenways website or our first page to make contributions. I'd like to thank Lydia at Greenways who has pulled all this together and has done a fantastic job moving our courses from the classroom to the computer, managing all the technology to make it happen. Today's course is planning a winter harvest, which you need to start in July. This class will guide you through a planting calendar for winter and spring harvest. Elaine Codling is our instructor. She is a permaculture design consultant and teacher with training in both Canada and Australia. She's been gardening organically for nearly 30 years. Elaine has a lifelong interest in self-sufficiency, food security, community development, and restoration of natural systems. We have been lucky to have Elaine with us for these courses and look forward to having her in person when we resume our courses this fall. I've had Elaine as a consultant at the Campbell River Hospital Garden and know you will learn a lot and she will, help you she will help provide you with invaluable keys to a successful garden. If you would like to get involved with Greenways and find out about all the initiatives we're involved in, from environmental restoration to food security, have a look at our webpage or Facebook page for more information. We also have a YouTube channel where you can review ex Elaine's excellent presentations. Okay, Elaine, over to you. Okay, thank you, Chuck, and thank you for that lovely introduction. We can skip over this first slide, which is just me, and I, it does have my email on it, so, and I will give you that again at the end um, as well. So we're here talking about feeding ourselves, and I always like to anchor the topic, the specific topic in the more general topic. So we're we're feeding ourselves. This is kitchen gardening. We're growing vegetables, herbs, fruits. Um, it's organic. So we're working with nature, not against it. That's an important permaculture principle. And it's year round. So your winter garden is just one part of the year round planting and year round harvest, which I am going to talk about a little bit. We're gonna mostly focus on the winter garden, but I wanna have it in context to the, with the year round planting. So um, we will be talking about the whole, the whole year of planting as well as the winter garden. So it's really important when you're gardening to know our limits. Uh, in, in, in some respects, we all have different limits. We all have the same limits as far as climates, the season and the weather, but we have our separate limits in terms of our sight. We have sight, sun, shade, slope, wind, wa the water, all of these things that are part of our sight. And then we have our own energy time and resources that we have to pay attention to as far as making sure we're not overextending ourselves or we're not in a situation where we've started a project that we just can't complete. So th that's really important in winter gardening to know what is possible, what you can actually do in, and um, be aware of what the limits are. So our climate in the summer is drought in the growing season. Um, we need techniques to retain moisture in the soil. We need to have effective watering strategy to develop group drought resistance, and we have hot, dry winds that can aggravate drought stress. Our climate in the winter is very different. We have kind of a bipolar <laughs> climate. Our winter climate has torrential rain, and that can cause soil compaction. It can also create drainage problems. Uh, we have sometimes extreme winds, depending on where you are, and this will you know, be specific to your site. Uh, what the winds are like in the summer are going to be probably different than how they are in the winter, winter and you're going to have more extreme wind in the, in the winter. So extra supports are needed and, you know, various uh, paying attention to the wind um, is, it's a bit different in the winter than in the summer. We also have frost and snow. So we're considered a cold temperate climate. That means we do get frost and snow. And that means we need to consider weather protection and frost blankets and things like that, which we will talk about a little bit more. 
we are on the coast. We are in the coastal mountains of the Pacific Northwest. So um, we have to keep in mind that slope and elevation can have unpredictable effects. You may think that as you get higher in the mountains, you're obviously going to be colder. But on the other hand, cold air drops. So if you don't have anything blocking that cold air, you might actually find, um, depending on your, your exposure, that you have a better climate than the people who live in the valley. Um, paying attention to your own site and paying attention to your own um, possibilities, what you can do with your energy and your time is really, really important. The, the thing is, we have this mild Mediterranean climate, which gives us the longer growing season. So the, the answer to the why do a winter harvest, plan for a winter harvest is because we can. Um, unfortunately, because we are on this kind of um, convoluted, no, whatever, crinolated coast where, you know, every different site is subject to different weather and wind and things like that, the weather data, the frost dates, aren't necessarily going to be useful for you. So really, really, just in any other garden, you need to keep your own records. You need to um, make sure that you're paying attention to your own site. So I use a spiral bound notebook. It's like a 300 page, you know, line notebook. I figure 10 months of the year I garden, the other two months. You can get a 360, I, I, did, I did that, and I used the extra pages for notes and things. It's really good. But pay attention to the sun, whether it's overcast, whether it's raining, where the wind's coming from. This is an image of a min-max thermometer that you reset every day. So you basically set it to, to show you how low and how high the temperature gets. It's really, really a great thing to have for paying attention to your own specific site. You also might want to have a rain gauge. Um, they're about 12 or 15 bucks to get, like it's really just a plastic tube with, with a ruler gradations on it so you check it every day you write down I'm finding really interesting in the last little while we've had this cool wet spring but in fact we're not getting very much rain it seems like we're getting rain all the time but when I actually look at my rain gauge it's very very little rain so that's important to know for your watering and and things like that the other thing that you can pay attention to is the perennial plants around you whether they're budding whether they're blooming you know, all of these things get written down in your notebook and year after year you you can pay attention to what happened, you know, in July last year or whatever, and it gives you a guide a guide to where you are this year. So your planting records, yeah, I, as I said, I have a, a 360 or 300 page, just a spiral bound notebook that I've divided up into, you know, five sections on each page, depending on how elaborate your notes are. I find if I take really elaborate notes, I don't read them, so I try to keep it minimal. Um, maps, you know, copies of your garden, if you can map your garden and make copies that you can write on so that you have a note that said, you know, I had brassicas in here and I'm going to, they're coming out in, in August, and if I have um, some Walla Walla onions ready, I can put them in that spot or, you know, just make notes whenever you do anything and and then you can have something that will allow you to plan will allow you to get into a rhythm of oh this is what i need to do next to keep you going with that year-round cycle so why plant for winter um one of the things extending the season does is it increases the overall productivity of the garden we all have a limited amount of space and if you're only gardening for four months of the year that's all you get. But if you can actually extend your season so that you're planting early in the spring and you're already harvesting in May and June and you're planting late into the summer and you get, can harvest in you know, all the way into October and then start harvesting again in, in February, March, you, you can actually produce a lot more food on the same site. Um, and you can also kind of manage your your crop so that you don't just get a huge glut of you know just too many potatoes like what am i going to do with all these potatoes or too many too much chard you know you or any of the things even the things that you can preserve preserving is a lot of work and if you, you've got food stored in the ground that's way less work so you know food in the garden means you don't have to rush to plant in the spring and then as i said because we can we have this mild climate 
we can do a year-round garden, so why not? The thing about waiting to plant in the spring is that you got to wait. You can't start working the soil while it's too wet. You can't set out transplants. You can't you can't cultivate until the soil is actually dry enough and warm enough. You need to have the soil to be at a reasonable temperature for seeds to germinate. Even cold weather, cool season crops like peas and spinach, you know, you can't plant them. It doesn't do any good to plant them too cold because they will just sit there. I mean, if the if the um, wireworm or something doesn't come and eat them, they will sit there and wait and they won't sprout until the soil is warmer anyway. In the meantime, working your soil when it's too wet to work has caused compaction and created more problems, right? So, you know, your best germination is when the soil is actually quite warm. If you have food coming from the garden, you can wait to plant and, and that anxiety to get going in the spring is a little easier. This is the spring planting. I put this up just to show you like when can you plant in the spring. Now keep in mind at the bottom of this slide, I've got, you know, you've got to track the, you've got to track the weather. You've got to pay attention to your garden. But frost free dates really give you the, you know, what is the chance of frost after that date. So when they say frost free dates in, this is for Comox, um, is from April 20th to October 26th and it will be different for Campbell River, it will be different, for, different wherever you are. It's not necessarily going to be that useful to you because you've still got 50% chance of frost after April 19th, right? I mean after May 8th you got 10% chance of frost and those things do happen but ideally if you can wait to plant you will have more success. So a year-round approach is what we're after. Um, I already mentioned about the planting too early causes compaction. Um, the pests are worse, you know. The late frost thing, though, that is important because if, if you're thinking of planting cold season vegetables um, in the early spring and you get a late frost, they're going to just go, oh, was that winter? And time to produce seeds, right? So your cabbages and things will start to produce seeds. They'll all bolt. And if, if they're too young, you'll end up with damage to your brassicas, particularly if they get a touch of frost in their growing tip that will prevent them from actually ever producing a head. You'll still get lots of leaves and their cabbage leaves and they're edible, but you won't get a head of cabbage, right? So the idea is if we have a year around approach, we can actually make the most of our site, we can produce more food, we can, we can actually have a routine uh, of the yearly cycle that um, allows us to feed ourselves for the longest possible time. So making the most of your site is important in summer gardening and in winter gardening, but in winter gardening it's particularly the sun and the space that is the, is the challenge. All of these other things still matter. The wind, as I said, is really important. You still need to maintain the fertility of your soil. You still need to manage your time and energy and make sure that you actually have, you know, a garden that you can manage and enjoy rather than be a slave to. But really, when you're trying to figure out where to plant in the winter, it's about where's the sun. Where's the sun until the end of uh, September, middle of October? Because once the days are cold, they don't grow anyway, so it doesn't matter. But also, where's the space? And we did already get a question from one of you about finding space. So I'm actually going to be spending quite a bit of time on the whole finding space thing. So we'll carry on. Um, thinking about what plants need. They need light while they are growing. And as I mentioned, they uh, stop uh, growing kind of shortly after equinox. The, the days become too short and the nights become too cold. So the, the, the temperature once once the temperature drops and the days don't warm up very quickly i mean even kale doesn't grow when it's below 10 degrees so you know your plants need to be um, almost fully grown or fully grown at the end of the growing season in order to sit in the garden and be harvested all winter and in order to do that that means we need to start planting now we need to start uh, either start seedlings in the house or in seed beds or buy transplants or whatever it is, but we need to start planting now. We can't wait until winter and expect anything to grow. So 
um, finding space, and this is the challenge, because your summer garden is three or four months and it grows the whole time. And the winter garden, that's potentially eight months of food that you would like, and it stops growing in October. Generally by mid-October, it's not growing anymore. So if you, realistically, if you were gonna produce as much food in the winter as you do in the summer, you would need the garden to be two or three times the size of the summer garden. For most of us, that isn't realistic, but there are a few tricks to finding space for winter veg um, that will help. And I think this is where it comes to, you know, what, what is really possible for you on your site? That's where you have to think. You, you probably don't have the opportunity to expand the garden to two or three times its size. You have to think about what is possible. And one of the things that you need to remember is that, um, the sun angle is different in the winter. Okay, let's just carry on with this and then we'll get to the sun angle in a minute. So your space is usually limited and every garden has microclimates, every garden has sunny spots, every garden has the soil and drainage variations and there's always uh, frost pockets and places where the air circulation is poor. poor. This is deadly for winter crops, right? You need good drainage, you need to make sure you're not planting into frost pockets. So low spots actually become problem areas because of the drainage and wet conditions. And of course, you know, it isn't just water that runs downhill, uh, cold air actually runs downhill too. So if you have a site that is on a nice slope and the cold air can just drop out away, then you've got a huge advantage because you don't end up with frost backing up on your site. Um, the other thing you want to look for is you want to look for warm spots. Look for places near the foundations of buildings. Look for overhangs if you have rock walls. Um, all of those places are places that will retain heat and keep your plants growing for longer. So this is what I was talking about, the sun angle. The sun is lower in the sky in the winter. So you can look for sunny spots that would never be suitable for a summer garden under, uh, under decks. You know, check your your sun angle and it's a bit late to look this year but if you pay attention around the end of the season this year and at in the spring around equinox in the spring next year you may start to find places where you could expand and grow things for the winter that you just you know would be impossible in the summer so you you know there are options for winter crops that that just aren't part of your garden or might not be part of your thoughts for garden as far as you know, the sun is very different in the in the late in the season than it is right now. So, I think I already mentioned that overwintering crops need to be full grown by mid October. the The sun angle, as I said, is the same in the spring and the fall. So, if you are able to look for sunny spots, I mean, it's too late now. But basically, this year will be your trial year. Next year, you'll be really well prepped and you'll have those spots lined up for your planting in June and July. So um, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for those spots where the the light is good and it might be near the foundation of your house or someplace where there's some rock or some thermal mass or you can even create microclimates. We'll talk about that a little bit little bit that help to retain the heat. Um, and as I mentioned, this is part of our whole yearly planting cycle. So I am gonna go through the yearly planting cycle, and then we're gonna talk about succession planning because with winter gardening, we may have two, three, or even four crops in a single bed over the course of the whole year. And then I am gonna talk a little bit about crop rotation too because it gets a little more complicated when you're having that many crops. So as far as the year round planting goes, in the spring, in March and April, you plant for harvesting in May, June, July. Your, your summer planting, which is really late spring planting, mid-April to the end of May, you're planting for your summer harvest, which is in August, September, July, August, September. For fall planting and overwintering crops, we are planting starting in June, and July and August. And generally everything that we want to eat has got to be in the ground um, and fully grown 
you know, by the end of the season. So there are a couple of things that you can actually um, plant later. Uh, we plant garlic in October and fava beans, and there's a corn salad, it's called mash or mache, um, is something that will actually uh, germinate in September, and it's a beautiful little winter green. So there's pretty much planting every month of the year, and then our overwintering crops sit in the garden so that they can be harvested during the winter. So for our earliest harvest, we plant cold season crops as soon as the conditions allow, and we harvest them in May, June, July. So those are cold season crops uh, in the early year, peas, radish, spinach, lettuce, arugula, all of those can be planted uh, early in February, March, sometimes February, but March. Um, and garlic and fava beans, if you haven't planted them in the fall, can be planted again in, in March. Um, they generally do better if you can overwinter them. The fava beans, it, what I find is that if I plant them in the spring, they're ready when a whole bunch of other stuff is ready and I'm less inclined to eat them. But if I plant them in the fall, then they're ready well, there isn't a whole lot of other stuff in the garden and that really makes me happy you know something to eat in the hunger gap in spring so for summer harvest we're planting in april and may and we're harvesting july august september and those are all our heat lovers you know our classic summer garden tomatoes peppers and basils and squashes and cucumbers and all of those things and the root vegetables are interesting because you can usually get away with planting um, root vegetables several times over the course of the year. My last planting of carrots will be July 1st. Um, but, you know, I try to plant carrots several times between sort of mid-May, carrots need warm soil. Between mid-May and July 1st, I try to plant a few times. Um, for fall harvest, and this is where we're, we're talking about right now, in June and July, we plant and we harvest in October, November. So we can do another planting of peas. We can do all the cold season greens and spinach. Generally, you're going to need to find a place that is either shaded or behind a taller crop or is a little bit cooler. This year is a cool year, so it's a great year for planting these cold season crops a second time. Even right now, this week or next week. Um, and also all of your brassicas and overwintering vegetables. So anything that you want to harvest before um, the frost, so sort, of, sort of the end of September, but anything you want to actually stand in the garden as far as your brassicas and overwintering vegetables, they do like to germinate in heat, although there's, there's uh, you also have to protect them. And we're going to talk about protecting the crops quite a lot. So, you know, the things, they are going to stand in the garden for the longest. They need to be planted, they need to be almost full grown, and then they're gonna start growing again in the spring as soon as the temperature goes up to 10 degrees. So for spring harvest, we're planting in the late summer and we harvest in March to June or July. Um, those are overwintering vegetables, kale, purple spreading broccoli, arugula, mache, which is corn salad, as I mentioned. Um, perennials and receding annuals like Welsh onions is a perennial onion that jumps up really quick in the spring and you can have scallions very early. Lovage is a perennial that's related to celery and has a, a very strong celery taste. It's a bit spicier but it's also a perennial so it comes up in the sp spring. Um, cilantro, actually cilantro is a really good one to plant in the fall or to scatter the seeds in the fall because it will plant, it will start growing really early and it's actually prefers cool weather because it doesn't tend to bolt so much in the early spring and parsley is a biennial if you get parsley going and let it go to seed you can often get like a perennial parsley bed you know that basically seeds itself and you have parsley early in the spring too so for winter harvest we want to plant overwintering varieties early enough that they're almost mature in by, by mid-September or the end of September. You want to plant enough to harvest during the months of no growth and replacement. This is tricky. This may not be possible given the space that you have. And it's really good to try and be quite realistic about what is possible. If your garden is full now and you really have no, more, no other space, you may find that your overwintering crop is going to be quite small. If you 
if you plan the year next year, you might find that you can actually get your year round planting and harvesting so that you get a larger winter harvest crop. And the other thing is the whole protection. We need frost rain and wind protection to extend the production of our summer crops into the fall and also to ensure the survival of our winter crops. So I've said this several times, plants must be fully grown by the end of September. They probably will stop growing by mid-October. At the, at the very latest, they might grow till mid-October. It's, it's both the temperature and the day length because if the nights are cool and the days are short, the, the days just don't warm up enough for the plants to grow much. Um, but your, your mature cold season veg, veggies, if they're well mulched and protected, they should be able to survive the frost and then you could harvest them during the warm periods. You can't harvest them when, it, when they're frozen because they'll just, you'll just end up with vegetable mush. But you, when the weather warms up, you can harvest them. The thing about planting calendars, and I'm going to give you some um, target dates uh, in the next couple of slides, is that calendars are only a guideline. It's the soil temperatures and the air temperatures that really, really matter, the light and the warmth that determine growth, right? So um, overwintering crops will start growing again when the daytime temperatures are consistently above 10 degrees. So for example, if you have overwintering carrots, once the weather warms up in the spring, those carrots are going to start bolting and making seed. That's why they've stored that massive root to, to be able to do that, you know, seed production in the second year. So generally with um, overwintering carrots and biennial crops, unless it's a broccoli, which you want it to sprout, you know, and you harvest it when it's sprouting, um, carrots you need to get you know, be on it and get them out of the garden by the end of February or early March, whenever the weather warms up. So um, the calendar is a good one for reminding you, but you really have to pay attention to the weather and pay attention to the, the frost, you know, and the overnight weather patterns and things like that. So your planting cycle is plant in the early spring for summer harvest, plant in the early summer for fall harvest, and plant in summer for overwintering crops. So most of the stuff we're going to plant for overwintering crops, we're going to be planting in July and then a couple of things that you can plant later. Or if you have transplants, you know, they, they can be started in the house or in an outdoor seed bed and transplanted into, the, into their proper spot in August. But mostly we want to get it all planted by July. So this is, I'm going to just go through this very quickly because February and March are past. This is sort of a um, something that you can refer to when you uh, go to the Greenways Land Trust website and see this slideshow. You can go, right, this is what we do in February and March. But, um, and this is what we do in early April and early May. You know, this is what we do. Okay, so we're getting into late May and early June. Um, Brussels sprouts, it's too late to start them. You might be able to find uh, transplants, but it's too late to start Brussels sprouts. Uh, if they get frost like cabbages, they won't actually head up. Um, the leaves will still be edible, but you won't get sprouts. Definitely your corn, your beans, you have the opportunity to do another planting of potatoes. Um, you probably could do bush beans, one more crop of bush beans if you plant this week or in the next 10 days and then all of your hot weather um, stuff should already be in the garden right now. So here we are late June, uh, winter broccoli, winter cauliflower, winter cabbage, parsnips. Parsnips are actually a really good overwintering crop. Um, all of those in July, as I mentioned, uh, July 1st is sort of my target date for planting carrots, uh, beets, turnips, rutabaga, but also um, your, your cool, cool weather greens like um, endive and radicchio and chard, um, kohlrabi. Kohlrabi is a, you know, as with your brassicas, probably you could plant it a little later but I mean at this time of year I'm pouring through the seed catalogs to see how many days to harvest and to think about you know what can I actually get in so late July and early August all of your 
winter greens, arugula, winter lettuce, your onions and scallions if you have seedlings. Um, generally, if you want to do overwintering onions, I'm starting seeds for Walla Wallas this week. So, you know, that would be started indoors or in an outdoor seed bed and transplanted out in August, maybe mid-August. Um, radish, you could do more radish. You can do mizuna and collards and kale and all of your um, your greens, all of your sort of mescaline um, and mixed salad greens. Corn salad, that's mash, that's the same one. You can plant that in August. You can plant that actually in September. Um, the corn salad germinates very late. It's amazing. It's one of the few things I know that actually germinates in the cold weather and, and grows beautifully all winter. Okay, so in late August, mid to September, the corn salad, the cilantro, the arugula, and the winter lettuce. So you, you may not actually get a full grown um, crop of some of these things, like the cilantro will sprout in the spring probably, but you can get arugula, you can get um, winter lettuce, and you can do baby salad leaves. You know, as I said, this is the time to pour through those seed catalogs and see how many days to harvest. There's a few, there's, there's little mini cabbages, which are just, you know, quite small. They, you know, but they grow in 45 days. I think they're called pixie. I think I have a slide for that. But, um, you know, there's, there's a number of things that you can grow. And then the last planting is in October. We plant garlic in October, generally after the Thanksgiving weekend and fava beans. And I have actually been told, and I haven't tried it, that sweet peas, sweet peas is something you can plant um, in October and they will basically sit and start to sprout as soon as they can in the spring. So that's gonna be an experiment for me this year. So your cool season crops, spring and fall, your heat lovers, May to September, and your cold season crops, your cold crops, overwintering crops. And you got to remember that it's all going to stop growing in October. So for example, carrots, I mentioned July 1st is my target date for growing carrots. I can plant carrots later in July, but they won't actually be as big by the time they stop growing and they will still um, start going to seed in the spring at the same time. So it's not like they're going to get any bigger they're going to be little tiny carrots and that's fine if that's what you want but they're not going to get bigger in the spring they're going to start producing seed and they get woody very quickly um, when they start producing seed so here are the specific target dates um, february 2nd uh, time just do to begin your indoor starts and if the weather is good you can actually plant some some of these things outdoors uh, I always do my tomatoes around March 15th and then the Victoria Day. This is your classic prairie garden, right? When you live in Saskatchewan, you plant your garden on the Victoria Day long weekend and you harvest it all uh, on the September 1st long weekend and you spend a lot of time preserving everything you can. But here we get to do longer. So July 1st, uh, carrots, uh, start, start your over and wintering onions indoors and seed your cool weather crops for fall. Um, by August or shortly after the long weekend, the winter greens um, and you can set out your onion seedlings usually, you know, early to mid-August and then Thanksgiving garlic and fava beans. And corn salad in there somewhere, I would say corn salad uh, probably up until the beginning of September. This is a list. This is from the bcfarmandfood.com. This is a list of um, winter vegetables with their planting and harvest dates. This is actually very good information. Um, there's another one. I'm not gonna go through it because this is just for your reference. Planting and harvesting uh, winter vegetables on the south coast of BC. Um, really good information. You might wanna check out that website. The other thing I have in the resources at the end of this presentation, I will um, show you West Coast Seeds has a winter planting guide that's well worth um, downloading. It's a free PDF on their website. So then the question of space, where can we plant? This is the big question and I've been walking through my garden every day kind of looking and going, hmm, where can I plant? Where can I plant? So there's a number of techniques 
um, to make your succession planting um, that that um, will make it a little easier to find spots. And it might be a little patchy or seem a little chaotic, but it, it does work. It's a it's a really good way to to get more production out of your garden. So with your succession planting, this is basically setting yourself a, you know, I'm gonna plant lettuce every two or three weeks from March to mid-August, or salad greens, mescalines, radishes. I'm gonna plant peas once a month from the late in February to late in June. So for example, this week would be a good time to plant one more uh, crop of peas. You probably want to have a, um, um, a mold resistant variety you have to look for for the variety that works because generally peas will get that what's it called inanition inanition anyway in the rain they don't they don't do well um, you still have an opportunity to do one more crop of bush beans and one more crop of potatoes right so your succession planting for next year you've got it on your calendar on your in your mind that you're going to start planting you know, peas once a month, you're gonna plant bush beans every three weeks, you're gonna plant, you know, carrots every every six weeks or you know, something like that. Basically your your planting routine for succession planting. And it changes the way you plant your garden. You end up with space at this time of year that isn't completely full or you've already harvested out of that area and you have you have gaps that you can plant. So this is the no empty space approach. If you have transplants ready to go, as soon as that first crop comes out, you can put something in. Um, you know, if you've harvested a lettuce or you've harvested a broccoli, you can put a transplant of something else in there or you can use that space that that broccoli took up, which is probably two foot by two foot space as an outdoor seed bed. At this time of year, you don't need to do your seeds indoors under lights or anything like that. You can actually plant a seed bed right there and then be prepared to transplant it as more space becomes available. You can also interplant a short season crop between the plants of a longer standing crop. So my uh, common one is I put lettuce between my brassicas all the time because generally by the time the brassicas need the space, the lettuce is being harvested. And then the other thing is you can underplant so if you have a crop in place already, this doesn't work for root crops, right? Anything you have to dig out is, is not gonna work for an underplanting, but anything that you harvest by cutting off at ground level, so a cabbage head or a lettuce head or anything like that, you can actually underplant the next crop before the main crop is harvested. And then you just harvest the main crop you know, by cutting it right at ground level without disturbing the roots and this the next crop takes over the space. So this is my picture of my romaine and kohlrabi. And you can see that that kohlrabi is sort of being pushed out of the way by the lettuce, but the lettuce is harvestable and down it goes. I've cut it off at root level. I've left all of the bits of the lettuce that I'm not going to actually eat right there to be part of the mulch and the kohlrabi has the space. So that's that's a really good, you know, companion mixed planting succession. Now the kohlrabi has a space. I've basically doubled my productivity in that particular bed because if it was just lettuce, there would be nothing there. And if it was just kohlrabi, I wouldn't have had the lettuce. So that's a good one. Under planting, as I said, this only works um, if you if it's not a crop that you have to dig out, you can't under plant something that you're going to have to dig. So you seed the next crop two or three or four weeks before the previous crop is mature. You cut the mature out at, by just slicing it at ground level to minimize your soil disturbance. And then you've got the, the next crop is already growing into the space. You can also take your cool season crops and and plant them underneath a hot season crop so if you wanted to plant um, mescaline for fall under your tomatoes or under your corn or someplace where they're going to get a little bit of shade and enjoy a little cooler uh, climate until your hot season crop comes out right 
I uh, already mentioned that, you know, if you've, if you've harvested the cabbage and there's a gap, you can use that as an outdoor seed bed. And then you fill the gaps as you harvest. As you, as you remove things, you continue planting a few bits, you know, a little patch here and a little patch there. There's also the whole editing, the idea of editing. And editing is sort of like um, thinning. It's, it's, you look around at your garden and you realize that, oh my goodness, there's just too much. I planted way too much of whatever it is. Or you discover that it's bolting, it's gotta go. Um, or it's not producing, you know, something's sitting there and is not really producing. Well, you can let it sit there or you can quickly plant something else in that spot. Or even if you've planted two or three varieties and this one isn't as productive or it isn't as tasty, you can, you can just go, okay, this crop is going to be mulch and I'm planting something else here. Um, it's, you've got to be a bit hard-nosed to do that, but it's a good strategy for making space in the garden for the next crop. So we should talk about protecting the crops next um, because you know, protecting your crop becomes much more a challenge in the winter season, but protection can actually keep your summer crops going for longer. This is a basil, it's under a hot cap that I uh, made out of a, a water jug. Um, actually, my husband did that, he just cut the bottom off and there's no top, so it's ventilated and because it's basil, you know, I'm harvesting it all the time, keeping it small. I can actually keep that basil in that space and keep the basil harvest going into September. Um, winter crops, especially your seedlings, might need shade protection in the summer heat. Um, and of course, there's crop pests, generally pest populations increase as the season progresses. So, so protecting, your, protecting your crops from pests becomes more important. Right, so this is actually a carrot seed bed. I've taken um, coffee, burlap coffee bags. Uh, carrots are, and lettuce are really, really hard because they're tiny, tiny seeds that are very, very close to the surface. And if that surface dries out, those seeds have germinated, they will just die. So I've, I've used the wet burlap to keep um, the soil moist and I can actually just spray the burlap and go out in the morning and spray the burlap to keep it moist and it stays moist under there. The trick to this is that when your carrots start coming up you got to keep peeking because once your carrots start coming up they may start to grow through the burlap and if you rip the burlap back you've lost your carrot crop. It's, it's a bit tricky getting um, carrots to germinate on a hot year like we had last year this year, I'm hopeful that it will actually be quite easy to keep the beds moist because we've had cool overcast skies and a little bit of rain here and there. So it might actually be a better um, year for getting your overwintering crops started this year. Uh, this is shade cloth. Shade cloth is um, a really uh, nice product uh, to, for protecting your cold season seedlings um, and transplants from sun scald. You can use just ordinary uh, old curtain shears um, that you buy at the thrift store. Um, the main difference is shade cloth you can put up and leave there whereas the curtains you have to you know peel them back and then and put them back on so you put them out during the heat of the day and then peel them back at night. Um, the shade cloth is expensive but it's very convenient because once you've got it set in place you don't have to move it the lace curtains are, you know, the shears are very, very affordable. It's a little bit more work. But if you've got cabbage starts in a baking hot July day, the way we did last year, they can, it can be really hard for them. They're a cold season crop. They don't want to be blasted by the sun. One of the reasons why I really like underplanting is that Generally, when you're underplanting, you've got a bit of shade from the existing crop. But if you don't have shade from the existing crop, um, this is also a good way to go. And you know, you don't have to buy the expensive shade cloth. You have to actually, you can just get the curtain shears from the thrift store. So pest protection, as I said, pest populations increase um, 
over the course of the year. So for example, carrot rust fly might not be a problem for your early carrot crops, but um, it might be, they might be devastating to your late season carrot crops. So you can use a floating row cover to protect it like uh, a rime. Um, that has to be completely um, uh, covered. The edges have to be completely buried so that the insects don't just crawl underneath. You can also interplant carrots with aromatic herbs. <coughs> Excuse me. Or um, what I do is I top dress them with spent coffee grounds. So I go out every couple of days and put a little bit of coffee grounds. And, and basically the aromatic herbs and the coffee grounds confuse the carrot rust fly because they, they mask the smell of the carrots. Um, one of the other things that I do on a regular basis is I try not to use the mulch, for example, the carrot um, greens, I'm going to leave those in the garden, but I'm going to put them on a different bed than where I have carrots growing. And I'm going to put maybe cabbage leaves on the carrot bed, right, again, to confuse the carrot rust fly. This is a picture of the uh, floating row cover for the carrots. I actually would probably bury that edge. You can see, um, you can see sort of along the edge of it, that some of the edge of the floating row cover is under the soil. Probably the best thing to do is actually to have the whole edge under the soil so that the carrots at rest fly can't get in. Um, keep in mind that floating row covers like Green May are, they're great for protecting a, a late season crops from insect damage, but they don't provide rain protection and they actually increase the temperature underneath by a couple of degrees. So they're not shade cloth. Uh, Rime is not a shade cloth. They can actually, you can actually bake your cold season vegetables using Rime, um, which you don't want to do. So keep those two, two kinds of cover separate in your mind and separate in your planning. Um, so pest protection. Okay, this is the other thing is the wireworms because wireworms uh, like cool damp soil and they tend to go down deep in the hot summer and are less of a problem for your summer crops than they are for your winter crops. So they come back up to the surface when the temperatures drop and the soil is cool and damp. So you may actually find that harvesting and storing your root crops is a better choice depending on whether you have a problem with wireworm. You can still plant those late season root crops in um, early July and what you do is then harvest them in September instead of leaving them in the garden. They actually root crops store very well. They store best in cool moist rather than cool dry conditions so the fridge isn't the best place to do that but um, that's something again about your site. If you don't have problems with fireworm, then you don't need to worry about it. But sometimes it's easier to store crops inside than leave them actually out in the garden. I know that's contrary to the winter gardening, but there it is. You have to make those kinds of decisions sometimes. And then hoop house, cold frame. This is actually an interesting way of extending your season because you can actually keep things a little warmer, particularly at night and keep them growing for a little longer if you create infrastructure like this for your garden. This is also a really interesting way to go. Um, this year I've been looking at, I have a bed that has basil and lettuce and peppers in it, and it's cool and down, but none of those things particularly, I mean, the lettuce is fine, but uh, you know, throwing a little hoop house over that bed has been a real temptation for me. I haven't been able to get to it yet, but I've, I've been, I've just been using the hot caps, but you know, a hoop house like that can do the whole bed. It's really quite nice. So tomatoes, I'm just talking about protecting your tomatoes in terms of protecting your summer crops and keeping them going for longer in the season. The thing about late blight is that you get tomato blight when the leaves get wet and they stay wet for more than 10 hours. So hoop houses is a great way to extend your harvest into the fall you need to make sure your hoop house is properly ventilated because if you get condensation inside the hoop house you've just defeated your purpose and you're going to have blight anyway. Um, this is another image of a this is a herb spiral uh, so stones and rock walls actually retain heat. The first time I ever made a herb spiral 
uh, I was absolutely astounded at how long my herbs and vegetables kept growing into the fall with the same amount of light, just that extra warmth in the soil. And I had, you know, basil, actually, my last harvest of basil in October that year. So I had planted perennial herbs and then I planted the basil in between to make sure because perennial herbs get really, really big and I several times planted them too close together. So I was planting the basil in between to give them the space. And I, I really didn't have any expectation of having a better basil crop, but it was phenomenal. So something like that, that, you know, and it doesn't have to be a herb spiral. It could just be the foundation of the house or, or a rock wall, a retaining wall, something like that, that actually, is a heat sink it's a thermal mass that would actually have a warmer spot for things to grow next to so the supports we talked about heavy winds so extreme winds in the winter time you think about the amount of windage on a fully grown broccoli or cabbage plant and it's huge right so you get a heavy wind i use the big tomato cages strangely i've never found tomato cages that useful for tomatoes but i use the big tomato cages for broccoli and cauliflower and uh, kohlrabi and all of the cabbage family. If you're planting uh, pole beans late, you want to make sure that you you have at least two poles, you know, like so that or a TP so it's supported. Um, remember that your peas actually need wire or spring to grow on. And again, if you've got a wire, you know, a whole row of peas, that's a lot of windage, right? So you really need to make sure that they're secure or you're going to be out there, you know, trying to prop it up and yeah, anyway, adventures in gardening. If you're planting trees or shrubs in the fall, you usually will need one, more than one support because, because of the winter winds. Frost protection. So that's the next thing. Overwintering crops need to be mulched. You need to, especially your root crops, need to be heavily mulched so that if the ground freezes, your, your veggies don't freeze. Um, Generally, you're not harvesting during frost or freezing weather. You're harvesting in the warm spells in between. And I tend to, if it's a nice day, I treat it like a shopping trip to the grocery store. I go out in the garden and I fill the fridge because more often than not, I'm going to want something and it's not going to be there and it's going to be lousy weather for getting anything out of the garden. So frost protection, frost blankets, heavy mulch, I mean, I generally recommend heavy mulch for your garden in the wintertime, whether you have crops in there or not, because the, the torrential rain we get in the winter can really, really pound your soil and can cause compaction. And then you have to, you know, either till or dig or something like that. And it, it's just really hard on the soil microorganisms and everything. Um, so maintaining fertility, this is a real challenge. If you're going to have two, three, or even four crops come out of a bed in a year, you really have to work on maintaining your fertility. Uh, one of the things uh, I recommend is the no-dig method. So you harvest with a knife, you cut the plant off at the soil level, you leave the root mass to decompose and all that biomass to feed the soil microorganisms. You leave all your crop residues. I mean, if you think about it just for your own labor saving, you don't want to bring stuff into the house that you just have to carry out in the compost again. You don't want to put things in the compost that you're going to have to, you know, haul back to the garden as, as finished compost if you can just use it as mulch, right? And even weeds, most crop, most food crops don't particularly like to be weeded because, you know, you're pulling out weed roots, you're, you're actually disturbing the roots of your vegetables too. So if you can cut them off at ground level, um, or if they come out easily, then you can leave them on top of the mulch, unless they're going to either re-root, which generally means your, your mulch isn't thick enough, or if they're already producing seeds. I will often just pull the flower heads or you know, pull them, pull them apart so that they don't get a chance to go to seed. Um, and try to leave as much biomass in the garden as you possibly can, just as a practice all the time. The other thing is to maintain fertility by including nitrogen-fixing legumes in your succession. Uh, fava beans are a great one for your winter succession because, um, you know, all the legumes are nitrogen-fixing. Make sure that you're adding compost before you do re replanting. So um, basically when the new crop 
is going in, you're adding compost. Generally, you want to add fertility as you're planting or before you're planting, but you can also top dress with organic fertilizer, use uh, compost tea, um, you know, liquid fertilizer, and of course, you know, mulch, 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 and mulch some more uh, to maintain the health of your soil. So this is a recipe for an organic fertilizer top dressing. This is from uh, Steve Solomon's book, Growing Vegetables West of the Cascades. Um, and if it looks like more like animal food than plant food, you're right. It actually is to feed your soil organisms, not your plants. So this is the kind of thing where you do a tiny sprinkle, like a tiny little, I don't know if you can see my fingers, tiny little sprinkle along the sides of your plants. Um, just to feed those soil microorganisms. And then of course the soil probiotics, the actively aerated compost teas, you, if you have a compressor that you can bubble it, um, you use finished compost or worm castings, you, you keep it bubbling for the full 24 hours and then use it immediately. You can also use it as a, a, to sprinkle on plants that are being eaten or that are suffering. Um, generally I tend to if the annuals in my garden are not doing well, I tend to get them out and put some, plant something else quick. Uh, and I use the foliar spray if I have perennials that are ailing rather than worrying about the annuals. Um, crop rotation, we just have a couple more minutes. So basically your crop rotation gets a little bit more complicated, but it's the same crop, uh, crop rotation. You know, it's the same reasons. Uh, to, to reduce the chances of getting soil diseases, to in, improve your fertility, to maximize your use of space and to facilitate your continuous harvest. These are the ones for the coast that need to be rotated because of soil diseases. Um, the brassicas and the alliums, the onion family and the brassicas both have soil diseases in on the coast here. If you're gardening in a different place, this may not apply to you and you really probably should connect with local gardeners and find out how the crop rotation and what risks of soil diseases you have. The carrot family is rotated is mainly because of the carrot rust fly. Uh, generally you can plant your spring carrots in the same place that your fall carrots uh, came out of because the populations are lower in the spring, but you can't plant your um, your fall crop where you just took your spring carrots out because the populations are higher and they will find find it. And knowing those families um, is really, really important so that you can keep your crop rotation straight. Okay, so where are we going to plant? The peas are almost done. Uh, early potatoes are being harvested and the garlic will be out in three or four weeks. Those are all good options. Um, the carrots and beets are coming out, so there might be spaces in those beds. Um, anything else, you still need room. You know, your, your mature summer cabbages and mature red root vegetables can be stored in the cold room for weeks, right? So they can come out if they're mature, they can come out uh, if you need the space. If you don't need the space, they can probably sit in the garden for a while yet. But this is, you know, where are we going to plant our winter crops and these are options that you have. So the final succession, this is where I am uh, in the next couple of weeks thinking about, as I said, going through your seed catalog to find out how many days to harvest. This is the pixie mini cabbage I mentioned. 45 days to harvest, that means if I want to harvest that cabbage by the middle of September, I need to get it in the ground by the beginning of August. So, you know, it's like I start counting backwards at this point to, you know, how long, how long is it going to take? I mean, I, I can't really guarantee I'm going to have anything, success with anything that's going to take more than two months, two and a half months, maybe. But, you know, that, that becomes iffy. If we get an early, early winter and severe weather, it might not be ready to come out. Your winter varieties... Keep in mind that your winter varieties and your summer varieties are not exactly the same. Your, your summer varieties, particularly of the cabbage family, are annuals. And you're looking for winter varieties, you're looking for biennials. 
Um, all of your cold hardy greens, that's part of your final succession. And root vegetables that can be eaten small or large. I mean, if you miss the July 1st target date for planting carrots and you want to plant carrots still in the middle of July, you just have to accept that they're not going to be, you know, as big as they could have been. And they can be eaten small and they're still delicious. So that's great. So that's the final succession. What to do right now. So start seeds for transplanting into beds that will be harvested in July and August. So you can do seed trays or you can do outdoor seed beds. Um, start thinking about cold protection for your summer crops and get that organized and ready to go so that when the weather turns, you have it. And then plant your uh, cool season uh, greens, your mescalines and things like that in the shade of your taller standing crops. Um, you can, if you can buy starts of winter uh, broccoli and cabbage and cauliflower, and you can start putting that into the gaps where your summer crops are being harvested. You can replant all your cool season spring veggies. As I said, you still time to plant another thing of uh, peas, another crop of peas. You could do bush beans. You could do another crop of potatoes, and then. Um, side dress all of your existing crops with compost or organic fertilizer to maintain the fertility and that's the to-do list and this is the end slide with the thank you from greenways and i'm going to ask lydia to come on and take your questions for a while thank lydia? you so much elaine yes i'm here press the button Great. i hope everybody can hear me Thank you so much, Elaine. That was so interesting again. And I'm so sad that this is the last one, but um, yeah, it would be lovely to hear from everybody where you're at um, because we have promoted it on Facebook. So people can call in from anywhere. And I'd just like to know from where everybody's listening. Um, we got a couple of questions in. So um, I will just start with, um, I have, just give me one. Wow, Prince Rupert, Prince Rupert, Salt Spring Island. That is so interesting. Yeah, technology makes it possible. That's fantastic. Okay, I'll just do first come, first serve. So we have Nancy here who is wondering when to plant uh, Brussels sprouts for harvesting all fall? Um, I would say you're probably late. You might be able to find Brussels sprouts as starts at your farmer's market, but if I were direct seeding them, I probably would have started uh, in early June. The problem is that if they get a touch of frost at the wrong time, they won't actually produce sprouts. I mean, you could certainly try. I wouldn't, I wouldn't devote a lot of space to them, but you, and you could try, but um, you'd probably be better off to see if you can get transplants at this point. Right. Um, and Nancy is furthermore wondering, um, like after harvesting potatoes, is there something that she should add to the soil? Um, and she read that she should not plant potatoes in the same place the following year? Um, well, there's two reasons why you're not going to plant them in the same place. One is that that crop is always taking the same nutrients out of the soil, right? So if you have lots of compost and you can, you know, basically uh, re-fertilize, you know, reinvigorate that bed, you probably are fine to plant potatoes a second time. I don't generally, I mean, I try, generally try to stick to the uh, crop rotation, potatoes part of the rotation because the brassicas and the alliums have to be rotated. The Everything else has to be rotated as well. And um, the only thing I would caution you is not to plant tomatoes in a bed that's had potatoes in it because they're of the same family. Um, and apparently uh, potatoes, even though they don't suffer from late, late blight, they do carry it. Um, the 
the problem is that blight is one of those things that's just there if the conditions are right for it it will happen but it's kind of like running with scissors you just you know you don't want to set yourself up for problems so mm -hmm. ideally not tomatoes after potatoes and um i would say some kind of a nitrogen fixing crop um or you could probably do alliums after potatoes so onions or garlic after potatoes mm -hmm. yeah something like that okay lovely thank you elaine um we received a question from derry uh, in advance that is regarding composting and he was wondering um which kind of cardboard would qualify best um for yeah to use for for composting um and if egg cartons would be appropriate at all or craft paper um yeah i i appreciate that you sent that um, question in in advance jerry because i've been thinking about it i wouldn't normally compost any of those things i mean i use cardboard for sheet mulch and any cardboard that doesn't have a shiny photo finish or a lot of plastic on it could be used to sheet mulch but as far as uh, looking for something high carbon for your uh, compost I don't I guess I think I tend to think of leaves or or yard waste or dried grass clippings or any of those things and I don't tend to think of uh, composting paper as long as it's not um, colored like colored printing or colored paper you know if it's ordinary sort of craft paper color uh, I think it would probably be fine um, yeah egg cartons I don't see um, that being a problem although honestly I would be more inclined to try and find someone who produces eggs because they are chronically looking for egg cartons um, if there's a farmer's market near you, ask the egg suppliers if they need cartons. I, you know, I think that composting them would be a last resort. Mm -hmm. um, I do, I do put one of the things, one of the paper products that I do put into the compost is the mushroom bags. If I buy mushrooms at the grocery store, I tend to put the mushroom bags in the compost because if there's mushroom spores on the bags, that is good for the soil. And it adds to the soil diversity. I mean, I don't know that it does. I've never actually asked a scientist or research that I just mm -hmm. optimistically put bags, in, put the mushroom bags in my compost. Okay. Um, thanks, Elaine. Um, we have a question here from, from Kate, who's asking, um, how do you edit while still allowing a plant to bolt to collect seeds for next season? Okay, well, if you're seed saving, that's a different thing, right? Generally, any plant that you're letting go is gonna need a lot more space and it can't be edited out. Mm -hmm. um, if it's bolting and you're not collecting seeds, that's when you go, okay, this one's done. Um, generally, I find if uh, brassicas bolt before they're full size, I don't want those seeds. I want you know seeds from a plant that has grown well grown to full size, been really productive, and is now, you know, as a fully mature large plant producing seeds. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I talk about editing out something that's bolting, it's like you planted spinach and it just bolted. Well, you don't want those seeds. You don't want to perpetrate that pattern of early bolting in your next seeds. You want to actually save seeds from a spinach that actually grew well and didn't bolt until later in the season mm -hmm. so you know when you're editing when you're looking at things that are bolting it's not your seed producers that you're editing you're you're editing things that bolted too soon or that are are for whatever reason not desirable as seed saving plants mm -hmm. thanks um, yeah, seed saving. Oh, sorry, but you know, if you're if you're saving seeds, those plants need a lot of room. They, you know, they generally get quite a bit larger than they do on their normal, you know, production year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Elaine. 
Um, Kate is also wondering what your opinion is on removing some leaves from uh, large brassicas. Um, I, I have mixed feelings about it. I tend to think that plants will drop leaves when they don't need them anymore. And the, the leaves, the photosynthesis that they are able to do is what produces the sugars that feed the roots and you know feed the plants. Um, having said that, I'm um, consistently removing leaves off of my basil. So, mm -hmm. would it be a problem for the brassicas? I don't actually know, and I I have done it. Um, I just generally don't partly because I, I, I think the plant will get rid of that leaf if, if it needs to get rid of that leaf. And I also am always trying to give my plants as much uh, chance to produce, you know, all the sugars and do all the photosynthesis that they get. So yeah, I have mixed feelings about that. I would really encourage you to experiment. If you've got, you know, a couple of brassicas growing in the same bed, try removing the leaves from one and not removing the leaves from the other and actually pay attention to the results and make notes in your journal about what happens, whether they actually produce, you know, uh, the same amount of food. I mean, maybe they do, maybe they don't, you know, but you'll know if you experiment. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, and then we'll just quickly talk about Suki's question here. Um, she, she's wondering um, how altitude affects the growth of plants and veggies year round. Well, as I mentioned in the presentation, altitude can actually have um, kind of a unpredictable effect. If, if you are thinking that the higher you go, the colder it gets, that may be true. But, you know, cold air drops. And if you have, if there's nothing blocking the drop of cold air, you may actually find that the cold air drops into the valleys and that you actually have uh, warmer conditions compared to your neighbors who are lower down. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, only thing you can do is actually monitor your site. Well, actually, the other thing you can do is you can talk to other people who live near you who may have insight into how it works on their land. You still have to evaluate what they're telling you and compare their property to your property. Um, one of the things that I would really encourage everyone to do is actually connect with gardeners in their own area you know, talk to neighbors who are gardening. And especially if you have um, elders who have been gardening in that spot for a long time, I mean, those are invaluable resources. Those people who have been gardening where you live for years, they know things that you can't get from books. Yeah. So um, the altitude is a, is a tricky one um, because it may not be consistent. You may actually find that you are colder than uh, lower down, or you may actually find that you have, because the cold air drops, that you actually have a warmer spot than someone who's lower down. Um, it's the only really way to tell is to actually monitor your weather conditions uh, year over year. So I really encourage you to get that. The MinMax thermometer, I think Lee Valley sells them. I can't remember how much they cost. They're not super expensive. But um, that's a really good one to have. And you may actually want to try putting it in a few different places in your property, you know, and monitoring and trying to see if you can find warm spots. Mm -hmm. Would it be just, I I'm curious here, um, would it for those kinds of um, questionable conditions be, be better or safer to work with an elevated bed? because you can potentially protect it better from the cold? Mm, yeah, that may be a good strategy, absolutely. Um, generally, raised beds have, have some advantages and some disadvantages. Um, they tend to be drier, which for summer can be a problem. For winter, it's actually a huge advantage, especially on the coast. 
Um, you're right, they can be protected more easily and there's sort of a bit of a cold air sink all around them, you know, in the path that you're walk walking on. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that might be a good way to go. Certainly, you know, a raised bed because it's a, generally it's a, you know, four foot wide is pretty easy to put a hoop house or protection over. Mm -hmm. uh, even a frost blanket, it's pretty easy to protect anything in, in that kind of a contained space. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, so he was wondering about that too. Um, okay, fantastic. So, um, yeah, frost protection was also a topic that Cherry is interested in. Um, yeah, how to best handle that for container planting and for a garden bed. So how would we actually frost protect a raised bed? Well, I would heap up um, mulch all around it. I would, mm -hmm. I would actually, you know, try to, for containers, containers uh, are, are tough. So if you're talking about pots that you could actually um, sink into the soil, bury the, bury the whole pot into the soil, that would be good. Or you could pile wood chips, bark mulch or something like that around it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because what, what happens then is the roots freeze. Um, if you've got raised beds, um, generally the plant roots are going deeper. And as long as you've got good mulch on top, you should be okay. It depends on where you are. I really have to say, especially since there's someone here from Prince Rupert, you know, I'm talking about coastal gardening. I, we're on the east coast of Vancouver Island. It's a very specific microclimate uh, bioregion here. If you're not in this zone, the best thing you can do is find people who garden where you are and talk to them. Find people who write books about garden, gardening in your area um, and talk to them. Um, I actually, I'm, I, I've lost my page of resources for some reason. I think when I added the end page that you sent me, Lydia, okay. but I have several resources that, you know, um, Linda Gilkinson's Winter Gardening, uh, yeah. uh, there's um, uh, Carolyn Harriet, a year on the garden path. Linda Gilkinson's on Salt, Salt Spring. Carolyn Harriet is in uh, the Sandwich Peninsula. Mm -hmm. um, there's another one uh, who's farther south, uh, Linda Coleman, who writes uh, Winter Gardening for the Maritime Northwest. And she, I believe, is in Washington or Oregon. So, mm -hmm our bioregion but a little further south if you are in a completely different bioregion you need to talk to people and find resources for your bioregion yeah um it's we it's sure. really it can be very different yes and um, we can make sure that the presentation that we upload to our website has those uh resources in in it right when we upload the PDF. yeah, yeah. i i'm uh, I think I might have just replaced one end slide for the other. So not technically perfect at this after all. We have to do more workshops. <laughs> one day we'll get, we'll get there. <laughs> uh, Cherry is also wondering if you would recommend planting cover crops when thinking about frost protection. Um, I hesitate to recommend cover crops to gardeners because they have to be, you know, dug under or plowed under. They can't just be left, um, you know, as a technique, it's very good for a farm and on the broad acre, you're not gonna mulch, you know, a, a large farm. That's just not gonna happen. So cover crops are a great technique. And as a farmer, if it's time to turn the cover crop under, you know, that's your job. You're gonna be out there, you're gonna do it. Whereas as a gardener, most of us have lots of other things happening in our lives. And if it's time to, um, you know, slash the cover crop and turn it under and something comes up, you know, uh, I always hesitate. People talk about fall rye. Well, fall rye is a grass. And if it takes hold, it's a grass just like any other grass. And it can actually become a problem weed in your garden. So um, depending on how big your space is, and again, you know, maybe you want to experiment, not necessarily do cover crops on the whole space, but maybe pick a bed and try, 
you know, experimenting with a cover crop. Um, as I said, I, I have hesitation because I know myself well enough that, you know, it may be time to do whatever task it is, but, you know, something's happening, something's going on for whatever reason, or it's pouring rain, or it's, you know, whatever, I don't want to do it, or I'm not able to do it. Um, some things you have the leeway and you can leave it for a few days or even a couple of weeks. Other things like cover crops, you really need to get on it. And so it becomes a technique that can go terribly wrong um, if you're not on it. And so that's, that's my hesitation. But once again, I would really encourage you, if you are interested in ha doing cover crops, to experiment. Pick you know, one or two beds to do the cover crop on. Um, and and see how it works for you um i wouldn't you know commit to doing the full garden until you've experimented on the small scale but but you know do it go for it um, one of the things about the knowing your limits is actually knowing the kind of person you are in terms of your style of gardening and how you approach work cover crops don't work for me but they might be a really great technique for you Mm -hmm. yeah um i just went down the list and i see there's people from royston and pemberton and we've got somebody from quadra that's so lovely to see where everybody is um off to the next question um ellen is wondering what you think about using soil heat tape in an unheated greenhouse to extend the growing season Oh, that's a question I can't really answer. I don't, I'm not lucky enough to have a greenhouse, so I haven't ever used that. Um, there are some really good resources on organic greenhouse growing. Um, I think New Society Publishers has a book on organic greenhouse growing. Uh, the other person that you might want to contact is Linda Gilkison. She has a blog. I really, really recommend Linda Gilkison's uh, blog as a, something to subscribe to if you're here on the coast. She does a monthly blog and she also has archives of all her old blogs that you can access that is just wonderful information and she will send you a blog of you know what to be paying attention to right now or and you know she talks about the weather conditions for her site on Salt Spring and how they may be you know in your site. So you, you still have to pay attention and adjust for your own site but uh, she may be able to answer your question. Yeah, sorry about that. No, all good. Um, oh, and we've got Mike and Jill watching from from Courtney. That's awesome. Um, here comes the next question, Kathy. Um, she has a potato bed that will be in shade from early October to late April. And would that be okay for garlic? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, garlic gets planted in October, but it, you know, it doesn't really do. I mean, it will grow if it's mild. If it's mild, uh, it will grow a bit in the fall, but it should be fine. Um, you said shade until late April. Um, yeah, I think as long as it's starting to get some sun in May and June, you should be fine. Mm -hmm. um, again you know as far as experimenting goes you might not want to commit to your whole crop in that bed until you've actually tried it so you know maybe plant most of your garlic somewhere else and then try a bit of garlic in that bed and see how it does right um it should be fine but um yeah mo it does most of its growing in the summer months mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's um, it's always worth experimenting because if it works, then you've got another bed you can use for your rotation. Yeah. Yeah, we always come back to the try and error. <laughs> try it. <laughs> just try it. see. And, and not just try it, but pay attention and make notes, right? Like use yeah. your journal to, to say, oh, you know, I planted this here. It's an experiment. I'm going to check back and such and such. And then, you know, make a note of, if, especially if you have your garlic in two different beds, you've got one in the bed that gets a lot of shade and one somewhere else, mm -hmm. then you can actually compare how they grow in the, in the season and, and decide whether you want to use that bed for your part, as part of your garlic rotation or not. Yes. 
Okay, thank you, Elaine. Um, I have, ooh, Sherry's in Vancouver. Lovely. Um, Colleen is wondering if you can put newspaper in compost bins. We've already talked about that kind of. That would be a lot well, of- Well, and, and I think as long as it's not a lot of colored ink, you're probably, you know, I mean, it will decompose. And I certainly do use newspaper um, when I'm sheet mulching. So it will decompose. It is biomass. Um, it wouldn't be my first choice if I had, you know, leaves or straw or uh, dried grass clippings or, you know, any other uh, carbon source. Newspaper, um, you know, it's it's just not ideal because, well, because of the ink and, and because it doesn't really need to be composted it can actually be used you know on your pathways to suppress weeds or between your rows to suppress weeds you know it, it doesn't actually need to be composted so it depends on whether you're trying to figure out what to do with the newspaper or whether you're looking for a carbon source for your compost and if if it's a waste management problem what do i do with the newspaper i would use it to suppress weeds first if it's what what kind of carbon can I put in my compost? I would use it, but I would rather have yard waste or something, you know, that actually needs composting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Elaine. Um, is there anybody else that has a question? Because I just reached the bottom of my chat list here. And um, I'm going to take this take a quick second and i want to thank everybody for for joining us tonight um feel free to send in a question if you have a quick one um it's been a blast elaine having you on for these five workshops if anybody has any topics that they want to see us pick up in the in the fall if elaine uh, if Elaine is up for more workshops with us, <laughs> please send us topic ideas and questions. Um, we would love to continue the series because we see that there is a real need for it. And um, yeah, this year and the the pandemic got us got really so many more people thinking about gardening and actually jump into action, myself included. I also want to thank everybody for sending us. Um, uh, support for our food security projects in form of donations. That is very, very much appreciated and will help us to move forward on a, on a, yeah, on a bigger scale. Thanks everybody. I didn't receive any more questions. Elaine, do you have any, any bye-bye words that you want to share? Oh. Well, I just really want to thank you, Lydia. It's been great. And you've done just a really great job of, of uh, handling the technical end and making sure that people know about the workshops and that they can sign up and everything. It's been, it's been lovely. And I would love to continue, um, you know, now's the time of year to get deep into your garden. And in the fall, there'll be more opportunities for, you know, learning and, and talking and, and um, thinking about gardening yeah. um, and I would just like to add you know best of luck with your with your winter experiments you know really I hope you have all kinds of success everybody and and uh, you know the answer is often just try it to many questions give it a go yeah so yeah. thank you Lydia and thank you everybody else for tuning in yeah thanks Elaine and I will make sure that this recording also gets shared on our YouTube channel, of which we are really proud, I must say. Uh, there are <laughs> more videos that also showcase a little bit of Greenway's work here in the community. Um, so yeah, we'd be happy if you, if you visit that channel. And um, there are lots of thank yous. I just passed that over uh, to you, Elaine. Those are all for you. Um, people find your workshops extremely helpful and I'm so glad to hear this. Um, so yeah, happy gardening. I mean, that's the only thing I can say to close this off. And I wish everybody a lovely evening. 
And um, yeah, let's say bye bye, everybody. Good night. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.